joy to be with you all today and speak to you on the Word of God and what He has to say to us today. I want to pray, and then I want to, this is a weird seat of a request, I want you to leave your Bibles closed for a few minutes, it's a strange thing to request here, but I want to, for a few minutes, recite uh, a passage, and then we'll open up our, our Bibles and look at a particular few verses here. My, my aim is to be a worker with you for your joy. I want us to enjoy and be satisfied in our great God. And I want us to recognize what it means to live as God-centered exiles in this life. Let's pray. Father, the kind of impact that I want to see in this moment is obviously beyond me. God, we want to see hearts changed through your word. I want to be changed today through this word. We're in chapel so often, in our churches so often, hearing a word from you, from scripture. And I want today to be a day that marks us, that is significant in our growth. God, I pray that our attention would be fixed on who you are. God, make us a people that are radically committed to pursuing joy in you. May we know who we are in Christ, and may we joyfully proclaim the excellencies of him who has called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. Give us those hearts, I pray, in Jesus' name. Amen. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who are elect exiles of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father in the sanctification of the Spirit for obedience to Jesus Christ and for sprinkling with his blood, may grace and peace be multiplied to you. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, unfading, and kept in heaven for you, who by God's power being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this, you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you've been grieved by various trials. So that the tested genuineness of your faith, though more precious than gold that perishes, though it's tested by fire, may be found to result in praise, glory, and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Concerning the salvation, the prophets who prophesied searched and inquired carefully, inquiring what person or work the Spirit of Christ in them was indicating when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the subsequent glories. It was revealed to them they are serving not themselves, but you in the things that have now been announced to you by those who preached the good news to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things into which angels long to look. Therefore, preparing your minds for action, being so minded, set your hope fully on the grace that we brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. And if you call on him his father, who judges each person impartially according to each one's deeds, conduct yourselves with fear throughout the time of your exile, knowing that you've been ransomed from the feudal ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Jesus Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. He was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but was made manifest in these last times for the sake of you who through him are believers in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and hope are in God. Having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth for a sincere brotherly love, love one another earnestly from a pure heart since you've been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable through the living and abiding word of God. For all
All flesh, thank you. It's like grass. All its glory, like the flower of grass. The grass, wither, grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our Lord endures forever. And this word was the good news that was preached to you. So put away all malice and all deceit and hypocrisy and envy and all slander like newborn infants long for the pure spiritual milk that by it you may grow up into salvation if indeed you've tasted that the Lord is good. As you come to him, living stone, rejected by men but in the sight of God, chosen and precious, you yourselves are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For it stands in scripture, behold, I am laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone, chosen and precious, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. So the honor is for those who believe. But for those who don't believe, the stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone, a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. They stumble because they disobey the word as they were destined to do. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession that, he may, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you're God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you received mercy. Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh, which wage war against your soul. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. This is the word of the Lord. Now, let's turn to 1 Peter chapter 2. Now I can relax. Okay. Uh, 1 Peter 2. Guys, if nothing else sticks today, I want to just say this to you before we get into the text. If you want to maximize your joy, Memorize scripture. Big, long passages. Start with a verse. Start with a phrase. Work your way to doing a chapter. I'll speak to Romans 8 later on. There's a good chapter to get into. First Peter's a great book to get into. My students know how I memorize, so I won't go into that now, but I would just encourage you to pursue memorization for the sake of maximizing your joy in God. It's a huge reality. So I pondered this book over the last semester or so, First Peter that is, and just trying to think through some various features of the book. We notice in chapter 1, verse 1, chapter 1, verse 17, chapter 2, verse 11, we're called exiles and sojourners. Peter's keen to say, you don't fit in this world. If you feel, maybe you feel, every time you get done with this year of Cedarville and you go back home or somewhere for the summer, every successive summer, feels like you fit a little bit less in the context that you lived all those years. Maybe the friends that you knew from high school, maybe Christian, maybe non-Christian, every time you come home, maybe you feel, I've changed, and there's this kind of distance I can feel at times of what God's done in me and what I'm seeing in my own life as I go back to these kinds of places. There's a reason for that. You're an exile. I'm an exile. We're sojourners. We're not home. This is not our home. We are waiting for a new heavens and a new earth. We are journeying towards that reality. Like a person who is displaced from their home, living in exile, wanting to return to their country, maybe you felt, I don't know, your freshman year, the first week or two, the, the longing for the homesickness that you experienced, say, I'd, I'd like to get back home, or you notice a, a roommate having that kind of experience. There's this yearning for home, whatever that is. We're not there. Don't expect to fit into this world really comfortably because we're not home as Christians. We are, in fact, exiles. So main point, if you're taking notes for this, today, is this. God-centered exiles live in light of God's coming kingdom. God-centered exiles live in light of God's coming kingdom. And I'll give you a few ways this shows itself in the text. First Peter 2, I'll just read again verses 9 through 12. 
It says here, you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you were God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you've received mercy. Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh which wage war against your soul. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. So first, God-centered exile kind of idea. God-centered exiles know their identity. They know who they are in Christ. Got to know our identity. So if you were to go through the book, just notice these things, you would notice in chapter one, we are a hope-filled people, chapter one, three to nine. We're a holy people, chapter one, 15 and 16. We're a ransomed people, bought from slavery to sin to life in Christ. It's who we are. We're born again believers, chapter one, 21 to 23. We're stones, isn't that exciting? Yeah, we're stones in a building, being built up in this spiritual house, chapter two says. It is exciting, it's very good stuff. Uh, we see there, Jesus is the cornerstone. He is the foundation laid for this building. There's all sorts of Old Testament reference here from Isaiah 8, 28, Psalm 118. But just to note, Jesus is this cornerstone. He's building a temple. There is not a physical structure today called a temple because it's us. God dwells in us by means of his spirit. God is in you. That's astounding. That's an identity marker for us as well. So we're, it says here, chosen race. That phrase in verse nine, chosen race, comes from Isaiah 43, verses 20 through 21. Isaiah 43, 20 through 21, chosen race. And here that, that text describes God called you out as a people. We'll see in verse 10, for a certain kind of purpose. You're a royal priesthood. Earlier in this text, it says you're, you're offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. You're offering these sacrifices of thanksgiving, of praise. Romans 12 says, you and I are the sacrifice. We offer our own lives to him and say, this is yours. This is my act of worship. What I have is yours. We're a priest to remediating God's presence and his word to people in this world, both saved and non-Christian to say, here's who God is. Here's what he says. It's not a pastor's job solely. We are collectively a royal priesthood in that sense. Beyond that, we're a holy nation. We're a people for his own possession. Those last three phrases, royal priesthood, holy nation, a people for his own possession, all come from Exodus 19, verses 5 through 6. This moment in Israel's history where God says at Sinai, you, Israel, are that. Priesthood, holy nation, a people from my own possession. Now saying to the church, this is who you are in Christ. This is our identity. Then he goes on in verse 10. This is astounding. He says, once you were not a people, but now you're God's people. Once you not received mercy, but now you've received mercy. This is coming from, again, if you just want to note this, Hosea chapter 1, verses 6 and 9 and 10, and then Hosea 2, verse 23. So verse 10 is, is highlighting Hosea 1, 6 and 9 and 10, and then Hosea 2, 23. I don't know if you recall this or not, but Hosea is a prophet. He tell, God tells this prophet to marry uh, an unfaithful woman. He marries her. They have a couple kids. And uh, immediately God says, hey, name that first kid, uh, not my people. Okay. Uh, next kid comes, hey, name that kid, no mercy. Oh, okay. And he's trying to depict, this is the posture I'm holding toward Israel because of their idolatry and their unbelief. You are not my people. There is no mercy coming your way. And you keep reading the book of Hosea. Oh, read Hosea. You see God is merciful and gracious 
and slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love toward his people. And he beckons them and he calls to them, come, come, receive the good that I have for you. Enjoy who I am, that I'm for you in this way. Be my people, receive my mercy. And he's saying it to us today, man, there was some point in your life, whether you were saved at five, six years old or 15, 20, at some point in your life when you were saved, there was a point God was not your God and you were not part of his people and you had not received his mercy. You were under his wrath, John 3, 36 says. And there was a moment in God's grace where you saw the beauty of Christ and embraced him by faith and said, I want to see and embrace and love and serve and worship Jesus Christ, King of kings and Lord of lords. He is the great and the glorious one. My life's going this way, I'm turning away from that. When that happened, mercy. You're part of God's people. You're joined in in that way. This is who you are. This is who you are. This is your identity. It is easy to identify ourselves by means of a job, by means of a position we have in an organization. It's easy to identify identify yourself by the man or woman you want to marry or are already married to. It is easy to identify ourselves by our GPAs, by awards. We just had an awards chapel on Tuesday. It'd be easy to find identity and comfort there. Military accomplishments, holding of particular offices. It's easy to find identity in almost anything besides our standing in Christ. And the Bible is relentlessly pushing us back to see who we are in Christ. We forget who we are all the time. Not, not literally, I hope, but in, in this sense, spiritually, We can forget I am Christ and the benefits accrued to me based on that union with Christ are these. Whatever you gotta do, I don't know, just do it. Get a poster, get a screenshot, do something to remind yourself daily, this is who I am because of what Christ has done. One resource I would commend to you is a little book called A Gospel Primer by Milton Vincent. Some of you guys know this book, I would assume, yes. So this is a great book. If you would say in this room today, I I believe the gospel, I got that part down, I'm kind of moved on from there. Can I just tell you, we do not move on from the gospel. We do not move on from our identity in Christ, nor do we move on from the identity of Christ to know who he is and what he's done on our behalf. Let me read you a quick excerpt here. I can read a lot, but I won't read a lot. So he does prose as well as poetry to depict the basis of the gospel. I'm gonna read some some poetry here really quick to just summarize who am I, who are you today in Christ? He says this, now when my time came and to Jesus I cried, he gave me the pardon for which I had sighed. He cleansed me completely from wrongs I had done, released me from bondage to sins, everyone. He shattered sin's chains, which had held me before and thus made me free not to sin anymore. That's true, just wanna say that. A child of the Father, he made me to be, and gave me the Spirit as his guarantee that being God's child, I will one day obtain a heavenly treasure that never will wane. While in me the Spirit gives power and love and sweet premonitions of glory above. In saving, God also justify me, accounting me righteous by his own decree, declaring me guiltless of all of my sin and bringing his wrath against me to an end." This wrath Christ appeased in full brunt on the tree. When bearing my sin, he endured it for me. So now God relates to me only with grace. The former wrath banished without any trace. And each day I made a bit more as I should. His grace using all things to render me good. Yes, even in trials, God's grace abounds too and does me the good he assigns it to do. And when I'm sinning, God's grace does abound. Ensuring my justified status is sound. No wrath is awakened in God at my sin because Christ appeased it, appeased it to say so again. God's heart pulses only with passionate grace which jealously wants me back in his embrace. 
I need that every day to remind me of who I am in Christ and to not give excuses for sin, but to say that's who you are, so live in that reality. Secondly, God-centered exiles proclaim his excellency. You know your identity, and then secondly, we proclaim his excellency. It's in the latter part of, of verse nine. So we are, just note this, a royal priesthood, chosen race, uh, a holy nation, a people for his own possession. Key word, little words matter, that. This is a purpose clause. You're given an identity to do something. Your identity drives and determines your activity. Does that make sense? I stole it from Aaron Cook, but anyway. So your identity drives and determines your activity. So the that, in order that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Imagery of darkness, when I mean, you read the Gospel of John, other places, darkness depicts sin. We've been called out of that, out of the rule and reign of sin, into the rule and reign of God in his kingdom of marvelous light. Very similar to Colossians 1, 13 and 14, which says, He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. This reminds us this imagery of creation, darkness, and God says, let there be light, and there's light. That's astounding. And 2 Corinthians 4 picks up on this. As God who said, let light shine out of darkness, God has shown in our hearts to get the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. Shown us in this way. And now it's like, okay, I see it. I embrace who he is. I have a new identity. So now I'm, I'm proclaiming his excellencies. Notice the plural usage of excellencies. There's lots of excellencies to proclaim. It's not one or two. There's a lot. It's like, well, God, I guess he's this, this. No, no, no. This is a long study to see who he is and what he's done in these ways. And when we see this and we enjoy what we see, we're going to inevitably say and spread a passion for that thing. We do this all the time, all the time. We are joy spreaders. We're just joy spreaders. If you have some kind of good food that you enjoy, my classes know, favorite dessert is what, guys? Come on, bring it. So they know, <laughs> so they know this. I love, I love it. So anyway, with that, I'm gonna spread love for that. Right now I'm doing that. So it could be a new album of music you enjoy, a new movie that you see, it could be Yourself, maybe you have Cedar Plague for the third time this year. Huh. And uh, you finally uh, get past it. You say, I'm healed, finally, I think. Right, you spread the joy of that, not the disease, the joy. And you say, I wanna, <laughs> wanna show that there. We, we do this all the time. When, when friends of mine have a parent diagnosed with a serious illness, serious disease, and it's like cancer or some other serious issue and, and some kind of like, chemo takes care of it or some kind of surgery takes care of it. Man, there's joy in their heart. They've just got to get out. It's who we are. It's what we do. So I would say if our mouths are not proclaiming excellencies of God, then we need to ask the question, is my heart genuinely enjoying the greatness of who God is? Because when we enjoy, we inevitably just spread. So now take it back to say, okay, I don't think I'm, I'm proclaiming that as readily as I should, as often as I should. So to kind of go back and say, am I enjoying him for who he is? Step back again to say, okay, have, am I looking to see who he is? Am I seeing in scripture the greatness of our God, the greatness of the gospel? And maybe you are, and maybe your heart is cold sometimes toward the the greatness of God and the goodness of the gospel. So this is, this is ongoing, brothers and sisters. We pray desperately. God, open my eyes to see the beauty that's contained in your word. The word is not the problem. I am God. Help me to see and enjoy what's there. And as you start to have that miracle happen in you, and it will, pray faithfully, read faithfully, study faithfully, memorize. God will do a work in your heart and you'll find it's, it's spilling off your lips to others. You wanna share that greatness with others. It's good news in Christ. 
We've been called out of darkness into God's kingdom. There's this kingdom that will overcome all other kingdoms in Daniel 2. It will not be shaken, Hebrews 12, 28. So know who you are and proclaim the excellencies of God and the gospel to others that we see. We call this evangelism. Let's just call it overjoyed. Let's just call it, I can't not talk about this. Third, God-centered exiles increasingly abstain from sin. Increasingly abstain from sin. You see up there on the screen, abstain from sin. Just stop sinning. No. Throw a word in there. Increasingly abstain. I'm not calling for perfection here, but we are calling for progress. That there's a, a real kind of progress that can be had in your life. There can be overcoming of sin. There can be greater degrees of obedience and righteousness that can happen in you and in me. Because your identity is such and God's word is such that is happening within us. So Peter says, again, in chapter two, verse 11 here, I urge you as sojourners and exiles. Note those words again. Kind of like Abraham going from a land to a new place, a sojourner in this way. We are aliens in a hostile culture. So based on our faith in Christ's accomplished work on our behalf, we are to abstain from the passions of the flesh. As he says, beloved, I urge you, it's a strong word, I urge you, I'm, I'm begging you, abstain, keep far from passions of the flesh. Chapter four, Peter says, that was your old life. You don't go there anymore. He says in chapter four, verses three to five, for the time has passed that suffices for doing what the Gentiles want to do, living in sensuality, passions, drunkenness, orgies, drinking parties, and lawless idolatry. With respect to this, they, the world, are surprised when you do not join them in the same flood of debauchery and they malign you. You ever get this? I'm not going to live the way of the world. The world looks at you and says, that's where they even, in fact, insult you, malign you, make fun of you. Why don't you join us in the same, Peter calls it, flood of debauchery, flood of sin. It's like, because I'm an exile. That's not how we do it. We abstain from this stuff. We go this way instead. Clear instruction is given this book to abstain from sin and flesh the desires. Read 1 Peter just study that there. It's going, guys, it's going to look strange. Don't be surprised. It feels like being a Christian is weird. It is. We're going to be different. Embrace the strange. Okay? Now I'm saying Christian strange, but that's another story. So, but just embrace the reality that the way this, this book is telling us to live is going to look strange in the eyes of the world. Just know that. Don't be surprised. Like, what in the world? That's going to happen. So be aware and ready of that. Notice as well in here, warfare language. There are passions of the flesh, sins, that are waging war against your soul. Whether you know it or not, war is happening every day in your life. Now we can be very passive in this, but whether you're passive or active, you are being warred against every day. Desires of this nature need to be resisted. They need to be conquered. They need to be shown to others, said to others to say, help me in the fight against this sin that I'm drowning in right now. And that includes any sin we want to think about. You need to know yourself. You need to know your weaknesses. You need to know the weak flanks of your life and the things that you should not do and get involved in because they will expose you to temptation. You've got to know these things about yourself. I've read uh, in the past month stories of Christian leaders who have bowed out of ministry because of accusations made about misconduct in their lives. I told classes this, that I've, I've said it before, I got... Um, really upset about that, seeing these well-known Christian leaders in the last year, two, three, four years out of ministry because of misconduct of some kind. Then I felt sorrow for their, themselves, their families, and then you know what I felt? Fear. Let him who stands take heed, lest he fall. 
None of us is above any sin. Do you realize that you are just as vulnerable to sin as any of those Christian leaders? Do you realize that God's grace is sufficient? Do you realize the spirit of God indwells you? Do you realize you have all things that pertain to life and godliness? They're yours in Christ. Do you, do you realize this, this tension here of, man, there's a, there's a vulnerability. I've got to be humble, seeking wisdom and help in these ways. And there, man, greater is he who's in us than he who's in the world. That's true. And so in this room, we can say sin wants to destroy us. John Owen says, sin is always aiming at the uttermost. Meaning sin always unequivocally wants to destroy you. It's never content to get a little bit. It wants everything to destroy you. B, killing sin or sin will be killing you. Those are two amazing lines from John Owen that are very, very true. So knowing our identity, proclaiming his excellencies leads us to renounce certain things in our lives. And what God calls us, hear, hear me. Guys, what God calls us to do, he empowers us to do. What he's calling you to is not some carrot dangling on a string you can't ever catch. He's empowering obedience by means of his grace and his spirit. And so look and see, look and see what are those things that I need to put off in my life. Take some time to ponder, to journal, to ask others. We have blind spots at times to ask others, can you speak into my life and see what are those things? And finally, quickly, God's in exiles live for God with eternity in mind. We live for God with eternity in mind. It's the last phrase in verse 12. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable so that when they speak against the evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. Again, the world may speak against us as evildoers, saying we are on the wrong side of history. Our beliefs are antiquated. We are bigoted, closed-minded. My hope for us as Christians is that we will love others as we love ourselves. Christians, non-Christians, that we will love others the way that we love ourselves ourselves. And if we love somebody, we will speak truth. Humbly, winsomely, with compassion, we'll say, this is true. How unloving would it be for me to withhold truth from you? I have great love for you. I want to say these things in these ways. And, and here's the thing. We want to live and love in a way that people will see our lifestyle and hear our words. They'll see Christ return someday, this verse says, and recognize why we were aligning our lives the way we were. And then they'll glorify God and say, I see who you are and what you're doing. That's the kind of lifestyle we're aiming for in verse 12. Others may malign us, speak ill of us. Some will repent and be saved. And in all of that, we're called to be faithful witnesses. So, in closing, say this, put off sin, put on righteousness, know who you are in Christ, proclaim his excellencies, meditate, maybe jot these down, meditate on texts like Galatians 5 or Ephesians 4 and 5 or Colossians 3 or 2 Peter 1. There's more, I'll stop. See what virtue and righteousness and obedience looks like. Get in your Bibles and say, what kind of lifestyle by God's grace and the gospel's work within me, what is he calling me to? And know those things. Then recognize, where, do, where am I falling short? Is it patience? Is it peace? Is it love? Is it all of the above? I don't know. But like whatever it is, zoom in and see what are those things. Get around people who are wise, probably older, 
who are excelling in areas where you are not excelling. See what they're doing. Ask them questions. Say, how are you operating in this kind of a way? This happens within a local church context. This summer, beyond, be faithful, good members in your local churches. Get around people who can help you grow in Christ likeness. With the church, coupled with word and prayer, and be a people who are faithful. Guys, those three means. Faithful to the word, having a plan with that. Faithful to prayer, praying the Bible back to God and seeing these things there. Faithful to a church, a local church community to be involved in, to know people and be known, to oversee and be overseen in your discipleship, to pursue that end. We're not around this summer. Staff, faculty, y'all are going home, somewhere else, seniors, you're out, wherever you go. We want, I want you guys to know this in closing. The means of grace that I'm mentioning here are available beyond this context. The Bible goes with you. Prayer goes with you. Local churches abound. Find a good one and plug in, know and be known. These are the ways we live faithfully as God-centered exiles living in light of God's coming kingdom. Father, thanks for this word, help us. Help us, I pray, to be faithful to live as God-centered exiles in these kinds of ways. Thank you, man, for these students there. Such a joy to be with. Bless them this summer and beyond. May we be a people that are faithful to you, passionately glorifying your name. In Jesus' name, amen. We're dismissed.